Hello everybody, welcome back to Red Tool House. It is now hot chick season. So we are gonna get ready for the hot chicks to show up at Red Tool House. Cause you know, you can never have too many hot chicks on the farm. But we're gonna get, uh, we're gonna actually make some upgrades to the brooder here because we're gonna be doing more broilers this year. In fact, we're hopefully gonna to try to do more than we ever have. So come along and we'll explain what's going on here. So I've already done some minor modifications to the brooder earlier this season and didn't put it on camera. So let's step inside real quick and show you how we've outfitted our small eight by eight here. Whoops. Oh wait, that was the wrong door. It's the other door. This is the right door. All right, so as you can see, eight by eight, no insulated walls, just studded out. And we had this little half wall here, this little e-wall, to keep the chickens on that side. And then I would just put some additional storage here, extra feed buckets, those type of things, little shelf up here. Some hangers for our lights, you know, so when they're not in use, they're busy burning the building down. A little fluorescent light we put in on the switch. And a nice window. So the issue we ran into last year when we did 100 broiler chicks in one time was that this was good for about the first week this size this four by eight brooder obviously after that first week they just got too big and there was not enough space so we uh, we wanted to go out on pasture i like to go out on pasture the end of the third week if they're feathered out enough uh, and of course if the weather's warm enough so four weeks in here it just got out of control they were just way too much uh, overcrowding so what I'm going to do is take this knee wall down, and while you don't like to have hard corners, I'm going to do an L shape. So I'm going to still be able to open the door, and not have to worry about crushing a chick with a door or a, door, or a chicken running out when I open it up. Uh, but that'll give us uh, half more space, 50% uh, more space that we'll have here, and still have the safety of the knee wall. So taking out that knee wall will be my first responsibility, a little demo there and then just uh, kind of cut it almost in half and move it over. And I want to take this time to mention, I know a lot of you guys ask where Kelly is. How come she's not on every video? And Kelly right now, she would love to be down here helping. In fact, she's sitting up right now at her desk doing all kinds of accounting work for a nonprofit that she does work for. And uh, yeah, she does that at home. She goes in once a week to take care of that kind of stuff. So while she's doing payroll and taxes and all that kind of stuff, I get to have fun and work in chicken manure. So that's what she's, she's not in the video right now. Now, as we progress through the week with this video, maybe she'll show up. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Of course, the battery's dead right when you start the project. Now you may think that was lousy saw, but actually it was a little bit of an earthquake we just had, so. So this antique hand saw was handed down to me by my great uncle Joe, who Joe gave me a lot of nice tools, and really knew how to use them. And uh, Joe passed away quite a few years ago and I think if Joe was looking down right now on me, watching me use his tools, he would probably shake his head and be like, boy, do you not know how to use anything right? All 
Okay, so last night after dark, I finished up putting up some sidewalls here. Really, one of the things I've always wanted to do with this brooder and just haven't made it to the priority list is keep from having the little pockets that are created by the studs. Chickens would get in there and kind of get trapped or, or you know, kind of crush against one another or when I'm trying to scoop them up, they go hide in that. So this will eliminate that opportunity. And of course, being Cornish cross, they're not the biggest jumpers, so they're not gonna jump up and over into that. Don't see that as being an issue. But uh, so I put that up, obviously didn't video that, it was after dark. There's nothing like running your circular saw uh, in the dark where you're only using the little LED light on the saw itself to see, not the safest thing in the world to do. But we got that taken care of. Now here's the next thing that I've always wanted to address with this brooder, and I thought now's the time to do it since I'm focusing on it. So I know some of you are probably already yelling at the uh, at your mobile device at me saying, those corners are too strong. You're going to have crushing in those corners. And while we've brooded for, for almost a decade now, chickens and brooders that have had corners, you know, there's sometimes been one or two throughout the course of brooding where you'd have a loss. You would find that in a corner. So I would say, yeah, okay, that probably was crushing. It's not a massive, massive issue. But you know, why even take it on? Why, why risk that? So we want to, we're going to add some uh, little curved features here to, uh, to take the corners out of the brooder. And I think I've got the perfect material for that. So right here are two leftover panels, sheets that I have from where we did the Coupe de Ville. This, this is the same material that the sidewalls of the Coupe de Ville are made out of. It's basically, it looks like cardboard but it's a corrugated plastic. It has these little spines or ridges in it. So you can get it there for you all. Eyeball that, mm -hmm. yep. Um, and these were leftover pieces. And the neat thing about it is it's extremely rigid with the corrugation. So if I'm trying to bend it this way, it stays very rigid. But this way, it's so flexible that it creases. <laughs> so we don't want to crease it. Uh, but we should be able to, to flex it enough that we can round off these corners. Um, so we'll see how that goes. And I'll probably just nail that to that siding that I created there. So I just need to cut five. I created five corners, of course. Did I? Yes, five corners. So um, get that cut, get it tucked in there, and see what that looks like. Okay, so I'm going to run the, the rigidity this way. When I try to do it vertically, which is what I was hoping to do to get the height out of it, then... Uh, then it creases. Now obviously I can cut higher up the sheet, but I need five and it's going to be a little close. So I'm just going to crease on my line and, and move up. So we'll see how this goes. All right, so got all those in place, all five corners. I think that's gonna work nicely, keeping them from getting crammed in there. The next thing I need to do, of course, is add heat lights. Get ready for that, or some sort of heat. Now, some of you, if you've watched the channel for a while, you know I've got one of those Brincy pads, those little plates that they can go under. And while that works okay, and those things are super expensive, good night. Um, the one I have isn't big enough for 100 chicks to get all under, obviously. But what was really interesting is I lost an entire batch. I think it was like 20, 20 birds that we got on a cold night. And I had that Brincy pad in there thinking that they would go under. And I don't know if it's a training thing, if you've got to just get it. You know, they just didn't seek it out. They, I came in here the next morning and the, the heating pad was over here. The plate was over here. And they were all dead over here in the corner. And uh, they just decided not to go there. I don't know if something spooked them about it or what. So I was very hesitant to, to just rely on that exclusively. I'll plug it in again this time and just see how they use it, but I want to have a backup or the primary heat source would be heat lights. So you see behind me, 
these fireballs of death, which I still have some hanging there, but I'm not going to use those anymore. Uh, if you've watched the channel, there was a little short I did. It actually was what caused this. And I almost lost the entire brooder. And as dry as it was that day, that may have caused the whole hillside to catch on fire if that thing flamed up. But the sawdust that was in here, the wood is in here, it was just all smoking. And unfortunately, that was pre-COVID before I lost my sense of smell. I just happened to come by and I could smell something. Like, something smells funny. And I was able to come here and catch that. So what we're going to do is we're going to use heat lights, but we're going to mount them on light fixtures to this uh, gantry style board I'm going to hang across here that we can adjust height wise up and down with some chain. And that should give me the added security of these things just falling apart when they get hot. So, um, and I'll, I'll show you some of the fail safes we'll put in place as well. Ooh, that doesn't work, does it? <laughs> All right, so what I'm actually gonna do is pull this tape measure out of my rear end first. Oh, wash this. Okay, so um, we're leaning a little bit. What I've got are three of these 250 watt red incandescent heat lights. Now, I know it's archaic, but man, it's, it's kind of the way it goes. Now, these bulbs, when I see them fail, sometimes they'll get so hot that the glue that has the glass attached to the actual light fixture itself will come loose and then they'll fall away. So if you keep this at that minimum height, yeah, they recommend 18 inches, but if you keep it at that minimum height, even if that falls away, uh, it severs the uh, connection. So of course the light goes out. So there's a hot piece of glass hitting the ground, but it doesn't stay hot very long. And it's, it's one of those things where most likely is not going to cause a fire. So when those fail, as long as your fixture stays, place, stays in place and the bulb itself separates, then it kind of puts itself out. Now the fixtures, what we're going to use, like an earthquake by your butt, we're going to use construction fixtures. I have several here, three of them, and we're going to mount them to this five foot long board at a certain distance and we'll put our three lights in and of course it'll hang bulb side down and we'll put some chain on it that we can use to adjust across my uh, main uh, support arm there. And what we'll do is we'll plug it in. I have this is where Kelly gets aggravated, all the stuff I save, but man, I never throw away electric cords. If there's an appliance that goes kaput and it's got a heavy duty electric cord on it, I snag that. This actually came off of a uh, trash pump, like a water pump. So it's, it's a heavier gauge, has the ground plug, can handle. Because what we're talking about, if we're doing three of these in series, that's 250 watts, 110, so it's a little over two amps per bulb. So we need to carry about six amps on this wire. So we want a heavier plug here. We don't want to use some tiny little lamp cord. And I'm also going to use, I keep all scraps of Romex as long as there's no nicks in them. So anytime we do electrical work or somebody's doing electrical work and they're cleaning out their stuff, then uh, I use the Romex. So we'll just kind of daisy chain these together, power cord on the end, attach the chain. And then like I said, I'll show you how we're going to put some fail safes in place there. So the whole gantry doesn't fall and set the place on fire. All right, so I got my uh, little gantry with my lights fixtures made there with the power cord on the end to plug in. And I didn't uh, didn't want to mess with detail in the uh, wiring process of that because if you show electrical work on YouTube, you'd think I was teaching somebody how to build a bomb because you get all the fun comments about electrical work. So anyway, so I had some of this chain that I purchased a long time ago for a very specific project. I just don't remember what that project is. So we're going to take advantage of it now. Use it for hanging our wires. Okay, so the idea is run a chain up through this hole. Hole that we've made. And that gives the ability to set it at varying heights. And then we'll do attachment, where'd you go? And we'll do attachment points here on the board. And instead of just doing hooks, because of the fear I have, and I don't usually live in a state of fear, but um, instead of just putting hooks up here that could be bumped, 
I'm actually going to screw them down with washers through the chain. So in order to raise or lower, you have to get the drill out um, you know, with the bit and be able to take the screw out and lower it. But that just keeps me from coming in here and being all bumbly fingers and knocking it over and setting everything on fire. Uh, or create chicken getting crazy and knocking, I don't know how they would, but knocking enough slack on that chain that it comes loose. Okay, so uh, just real quick, I want to show you some of the, some of the thought, some of the genius. No, just, I, can't, I can't even say that with a straight face, but here's, here's what I've got. So first of all, the bottom board, the pine that the light fixture is going to be attached to, it is actually pretty green. So it's still wet. So, you know, obviously not super dried, so it can be combustible. The hooks down here, there are no hooks. I've actually bent the chain back around the attachment point, the eye hook. So again, nothing can bump it to come out. The only way that would fail is if a 200 pound chicken would get up there and knock it down or strip it out of the wood. Come up through the holes and then where we've got our chain mounted, using a screw going through that board with a washer on both sides. And this board is poplar that's pretty dry. So it's, it wouldn't hold my weight clearly but it's definitely going to hold all the weight that we need in that situation. The excess chain I may cut away, although I hate to cut up chain, um, but or just tie it all off there so it doesn't fall down and become an issue. But uh, that's going to work, I think. So we're going to put some light bulbs in it, give it a test drive, because chickens are coming tomorrow. Just great. Fat boy. This is why we always buy a backup. Always. Santa Maria, those things get hot fast. Um, need more room for the farmer, man. Crack my noggle on ever. <laughs> That's why wearing a hat with a bill is not always the smartest thing in the world. Okay, so lights in place. You saw that second one I hooked up just fizzled out. So uh, there you go. But I uh, had an extra one. I actually have another one up here on my shelf if I need it. And I'm going to a rural king tonight, so I will be buying a couple more just as fallbacks. Feel the heat rolling off of those things. So yeah, we'll put some dried cardboard, we'll put some really dry straw in here, and also, since this, I made this a little bit bigger, I can move the other things that I normally store in here. So we'll bring our gas in here. I got some black powder I like to store, and then of course, uh, all my meth making material. So we'll put that in here. And I think it'll be safe with all this heat lamps and everything. Should be fine. All right, well, I, tomorrow when chickens arrive, I actually have to be on the road all day. So I'll be in meetings um, all the way up till probably about 9 p.m. So Kelly, hopefully, will be able to take care of chickens for me, Kelly and uh, my youngest son, Kim. So you'll probably see her on the video next. So we got the call this morning and chicks are at the post office. So Camlin and I are headed there now to pick them up. I hope they are 
all okay um, and that they all survived the trip. And then we will be headed home to um, get them all settled into the brooder and um, finish up the preparations that Troy started yesterday. So come along for the ride. We got three boxes and we've checked in all of them. They look like they're all good so far. Cute. And then here's this. Lots of babies. that corner that I was trying to things down. There we go. Get that corner for you and There's no other lid up here. There's That's not big enough to fit the well it might be. We might have to. We'll be right back, Kayla. So we got 20 so far. Can you get like yeah, like right where you about where you have it, but yep, like you further towards your foot. And turn upside down. Upside down. And then kind of <laughs> <laughs> kind of up. Hey. Oh, you are down in and then you kind of do this with it to get it level down in there and, and okay. make sure there's not a lot of water over. Uh, Twenty-four. Twenty-five. Twenty-six. Twenty-seven. Seventy-one. Seventy-two. 73 90 9 99 Oh! <laughs> There's one who's hanging out in the corner! You're going for 100 So they'll come either way. He's a good one. I'm gonna bite you. Tap 
chicken anymore. They don't know what they're supposed to do, do Act like you're a chicken eating. Tap on it. <laughs> yeah, there they go. Some of them are doing it. They're figuring it out. Okay, so we have all the chickens, all the baby chicks unpacked and uh, there were a hundred, we ordered a hundred, there were a hundred um, alive and doing well. So I'm very excited about that. And um, they're all running around so far. So it looks like, um, so far so good. They're healthy um, or it looks that way. So we have given them food and water and dunked their beaks in the water to make sure they know where to get water. And um, we'll be back down probably within another hour or so, just to make sure that um, the lights, the heating is, is good for them and that it's not too low or too high um, in elevation, I mean, from the uh, bottom of the brooder so that we know that, you know, are they colder or are they too warm? So we'll be back down to check on that, but so far so good. So it's been about an hour and a half later and I came down to check on the chicks and I wanted to sneak up on them, not make any loud noises or anything just to, be able to sneak in here so I could see, are they huddled under a light? Are they staying far away from a light? Are they warm enough? Are they cold? Um, and it seems like they're very active right now. They're just running all over the place. They're eating, they're drinking. They're, some are under the light, some are uh, playing in other areas, um, as you could just see in that video. So um, it looks like they're okay for now. I'm not gonna worry about raising um, or lowering a light to give them more or less heat. It seems like they're fine now. It is a 75 degree day today. So um, it, it's a good day, you know, it's warm enough for them to be active. Um, so I think they're okay. I'm gonna let Troy check on them when, um, probably tomorrow because he comes home late tonight. Um, and, um, but they should be good for now. All right, so we're, uh, what, day four? And everybody's doing well, still at 100%, 100 chicks, which is good. So happy with that. We had uh, typical West Virginia spring, gone from the high 70s to now it's low 30s and snowing, but uh, such is life. So the, um, the light settings that I have, I think are gonna be good. Uh, they, they're doing the donut, that's what I look for it. When they go to sleep, if they're not all crunched underneath the light, solid, they've got just a little bit of a donut. So there's a, a hot spot in the middle then that's, uh, that's what we're looking for. So with the three lights and even the heat plate, they seem to be enjoying that. Actually, that could be lowered a little bit. But what's funny, you know, these Cornish Cross, they're just, they're just little dinosaurs. And they've already outgrown uh, the little trays. I had two of these uh, basic feed trays and they're eating those completely down in less than a day. So in order to make sure that they don't run out, um, went ahead and went to the big boy. So here's one of our regular size chicken feeders that we just filled up with their starter feed and they can have at that for a while. So that'd be something that hopefully takes some 24 hours or more to empty and I can just top it off uh, each day when I'm doing the other chores. The round corners, rounded corners are really working well. They crowd over in there when you know, they're a little spooked by me so they crowd over in there pretty well but they're definitely not stepping on top of one another. The curve makes them just kind of keep on going around. So that seems to be working pretty well. In, in the past, we've always done uh, one batch of broilers, a batch being about 100. And this year, we're gonna try to do more. A, it was our plan before that we could have more for our own consumption, but also more for uh, selling to our customers. But what we're seeing with avian flu and some of the other things that are your price of food going up and up and up, that's really reinforced our decision to try to do more. So we'll see if we can squeeze that into all the other projects we gotta get done in 2022. But as for now, we got hot chicks here on the farm and we're excited to do that. Appreciate everybody watching, take care.